Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you all. I'd like to welcome you to the CARE uh, Banquet. We are really excited. We have a great evening planned for all of you. To introduce myself briefly, my name is Nisa Hamadi. I am a member of the CARE Urban Board. Um, I've had the privilege of working with CARE for about the past two years and also as a mama, and I tell you, since as long as I can remember. Um, so I've been involved with civil rights and all sorts of advocacy work with CARE for years now. Um, this past year has been extremely exciting for me because our chapter, as you'll hear throughout the evening, has taken huge steps in organizing vigils, memorials, press releases, halifas, and seminars all over the valley. Um, I'm sure all of you have some kind of affiliation with CARE or community leader. So let's just get a quick show of hands. Who here is a member of uh, Islamic organization, a board member of a masjid, an imam, or something where you have contributed to care or civil rights for Islamic work. Let's see who's all involved. Is there anyone here who's just a part of a student organization and volunteers every now and then on behalf of the Muslim community? Nope. Or who has done anything for the Islamic community in the past year? Not me. Okay, give yourself a round of applause. As many of you know me personally, I've been living on the East Coast for the past semester for graduate school and I've worked closely with the CARE National Chapter. I have met um, delegates and representatives from all over the world, ambassadors from other countries, and people who have been impacted personally by CARE's amazing work and efforts. I can now fully vouch for our chapter and say that we are one of the huge stepping stones that allows CARE National to be one of the most successful and in my opinion the most credible Islamic nonprofit organization in the country. Um, so I think it's really great that you guys are all here. Just being here in itself shows your dedication to the community, um, the community that you're a part of, and to the community that is to follow, inshallah. I um, want you to all quickly take a look right in front of you. You do have some literature. Um, of course, there's information about the board members, the speakers. I'm sure you're all familiar with our keynotes who will be here later in the evening. Um, you guys can take a look at that. And then we also have a quick list of a lot of the events we've done. We're very proud that, especially like I said in the past year, we've had events almost monthly. I'm sure many of you guys have been involved in a few of them or attended them or seen our posts on Facebook about it. Um, if you want to take a quick second, we want you guys to all pull out your cell phones. So go ahead and take your cell phones. Um, tonight we're going to have you guys, let's see, I don't know how many of you guys are on Twitter or know how to use Twitter. We're going to have you guys live tweeting and keeping up to date with our event on Facebook, Twitter, any other social media site that I don't know about with the hashtag CareAZBanquet. We want to ask you guys to quickly follow us on at CareAZ and also um, check out our Facebook page and like us. Um, it's facebook.com forward slash CareArizona. So I'm going to give you guys all like 10 seconds to do that because I want you guys to all connect with us and be up to date with everything we do the next year. I know you guys are all going to forget as soon as we go home. <laughs> Maybe we'll give a special shout out to the first person to like hashtag it on Twitter tonight. Hashtag what? Hashtag care AZ banquet. You can hashtag anything. If I stutter on my words, you guys can be the first ones live tweeting. <laughs> okay, now we'd like to do a quick thank you of um, all of our platinum and all of our sponsors. Of course, everyone in the audience, but we do have a few special uh, sponsors that we want to thank. First of all, the West Valley Islamic Center, I want to give them a really special shout out. They're actually not even completed with their own project, and it was amazing that they were able to step up and serve as platinum sponsors for our event. We really look forward to building a partnership with them in the future. Um, where is that table? Are you guys here? Right there? <laughs> they are creating a uh, Islamic Center Masjid in Avondale, so if you're in the area, we do ask you guys to all hopefully get involved with them in the future and of course help them while they are working on fundraising for their own project as well. Um, another sponsor that has been working with us for years, I'm sure everyone is familiar with them, is Amla, the American Muslim Women's Association. Where are you guys? All right. Their work is extremely complimentary to everything that we do. They've had um, our back with everything that we've worked on for years, and they're doing amazing work, everything from reaching out to refugees, they do food drives, they do fun events just for sisters in the community. Um, so, again, if they're they're extremely important to us. Um, we also have guidance. 
residential. Uh, they are the, where are you guys in here? You're the people, where is it? You guys can raise your hands. There they are, all the way up here. They are the largest Islamic home financier in the U.S. They financed almost $3 billion, um, and they are now operating in Arizona, so we're very proud of that. And they are um, really great at their uh, incorporating both like modern finance with Islamic values and ensuring that your Islamic rights are protected. So let's give them a hand of applause. So again, uh, every person here who's been involved with any of our work in the past year, any of the masjids, any of the great uh, organizations that are sitting outside or at uh, the Arizona State University campus, you guys are all extremely important to us. Um, we really hope that you guys continue to work with us in the future. We always need more volunteers, more helpers. That's how I got started with Care Myself. Um, we're going to do a quick Quran recitation just to start the evening. So Brother Omar Sayyid, I don't know where he is. He'll be coming up here. for being our first shout out. Yeah? There he is. So we got proof that you guys are actually following us now. So we're going to shout out, call you out. So don't say anything embarrassing on Twitter until this thing's over. So I'm going to quickly introduce, um, I'm going to be introducing board members throughout the night, some of our most involved and important members that have been really detrimental, or really important and significant. <laughs> oh so you guys can tweet about that. <laughs> I'm talking about Brother Yasser, so if that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> special, they've been very special to us this past year. <laughs> Um, he is the secretary of the board of the directors. He's a well-known neurologist in the community. He's been with CARE since 2011. Um, he's been on every event. He's been kind of um, one of the most educated, I think, board members because he's always got something to share. He's brought in so many people. He's got two whole tables here of people supporting us. So let's give a big round of applause for Brother Yasser. He's going to also be introducing our keynote speaker. but I will do someone else, inshallah. But um, really, uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking Allah uh, for giving us this incredible opportunity uh, to serve this noble cause of promoting faith and freedom. Um, we are here today to celebrate the efforts of those who day in and day out and stand in front of hate and prejudice and welcome all critique, 
for your right to be critical. They stand for our freedom of speech, religion, peaceful assembly, press, and just being who we want to be as Americans. We would like to share a vision today uh, with you because none of this can be accomplished just by ourselves. Our goal is to build a society that engages for the good of everyone. We cannot sit on our hands and expect everyone else to do our job. We want a society that truly does not discriminate and stands for justice for all. A society that adheres to the principles uh, taught, by the, taught by the Rasul Muhammad وسلم, the principles of caring and loving, the principles to want for others what you want for ourselves, what we want for ourselves. Care Arizona is dedicated to carry this message to all that, that can make it a reality. We are engaging with our civic leaders and reminding them that our rights are valuable in every public arena and the violation of them should have strict consequences. Our civil rights are also important in the personal matters and law enforcement has to be extremely careful to defend them and protect them when they're called to duty. CARE goes to every community center in the area and educates individuals on how to use their rights so even government agencies like the FBI don't cross their boundaries of authority to compromise their citizenship. We envision that we will have an attorney, inshallah, on staff to deal with all your concerns and questions should you ever have the need. We want to be a resource of everything regarding civil protections and information. And the proof of our engagement with law officials is evident at this gathering as we have commanders from Mesa, Tempe, and Chandler. A big applause. <laughs> They're here to support us today, alhamdulillah. And thank you. For those who question Islamophobia as a reality in Arizona, I will share with you that some Islamophobes tried to, tried to derail this event in protest to the attendance of Mr. Max Blumenthal, who will be introduced later, inshallah, because they did not agree with what he had to say, what he is reporting. We admire his courage to stand on the facts and share it with all that need to know this. We also are thankful to the management and ownership of this hotel, who did not succumb to the demands of the extremist groups. Care Arizona will always stand. Yes, yes. Care Arizona will always stand in the face of injustice by holding our ground for those who have something to say. You will see tonight the way Care has stood for you and your loved ones. We have put the value in community and are set to make it a priority, regardless of any challenges. That, that are thrown at us. We, the Arizona Muslim community, have to first and foremost understand that unity of thought is independent of our rights to say what we think and believe. We do not have to think alike, but we do have to work together. If you understand that our right to be an American Muslim is being challenged by the entire Islamophobia industry, that they have spent they have spent $119 million in the past three years just because they want to question your Americanness because you're a Muslim. If you understand that fact, you need to support the works of this chapter and care all over in trouble. These challenges come in the form of firing people because they pray, telling people to take off their head covering, Multiple anti-Sharia bills, we're, up, we're close to 30 now. One was passed right here in 2010 by the Islamophobes uh, in the state of Arizona. These topics have been discussed with lawmakers by Your Care Arizona and are challenged. In fact, for the first time in Arizona history, our very own Imam Anas Khalil opened the Arizona legislature with a prayer earlier this year with all praise to God Almighty.
our goal is to empower Muslim Americans to be the best Muslim Americans they can be. We are not here to hide in the shadows of something less honorable. We believe our religion demands excellence. We know that requires work at the personal and the public level. I pray that we all have the strength to succeed in both personal and public spaces. We have to remind ourselves that our moral compass is always pointing up. Care is here to make sure you do not hide your Islam because Islamophobes don't like it. They didn't like it when the Rasul brought it. 1400 years later, thousands of miles away, we have the same challenge. Would the Rasul hide in the shadows knowing what he had to offer the people around him? I say no. And care is here to make sure you don't either. Takbir. We have a, a very special presentation. Um, and Sorry, that was out of order. That was a lot of knowledge and information. I think he redeemed himself from a horrible introduction. So, uh, so we do have a special presentation. Uh, our keynote speaker tonight is Max Blumenthal. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his work, but he is a prominent journal, investigative journalist and a renowned author. He is selling his book, Goliath, actually right outside. His work highlights the racism in the Israeli-Palestinian Israeli conflict and how it ties in with the Islamophobic themes that we fight, we fight to expose and to work against. Uh, the key take-home message of all of his work today is that he's an exemplary example of moral courage. He sheds light on an, eth on an issue that is ethically just, and despite the pushback that he has had in the past, um, he's been labeled as a self-hating traitor, he's been had a, a, had a smear campaign against him and his work, he refuses to conform to the status quo in terms of social justice and continues to work to expose an issue that is undeniably wrong and unjust. Uh, I, I think he's a great example, like I said, of this moral courage. Everyone who's in here is a part of a community that has strong ties to the people that he is fighting for. He is um, very diligent in his work. Like I said, he's persevered through campaigns that have personally attacked him for continuing his work. And we meet many Muslims out there who are afraid to fight for their own people. Um, hopefully you guys can all take home a strong sense of enthusiasm and motivation from his work to see how much he's been able to accomplish in his career, and we hope to support him in the future as he continues to move forward with his work. So let's give him a huge round of applause for Max Blumenthal. I didn't realize I'd be called out this early, but thanks for that warm introduction. Salam Aleikum. Shalom Aleichem. It sounds so similar, doesn't it? There's some shared traditions going on here. Uh, can I get some water up here, please? Or maybe just something from the table. Um, I want to start, um, there are some references to some of the attacks on me. I want to start by addressing some of the attacks on CARE and apologize to CARE for not winding up on the anti-defamations blacklist this year. It's a real tragedy um, that MPAC has replaced you this year on the list of quote unquote anti Israel organizations. I don't know how they wound up there, I guess, but I, I do want to rename the Anti Defamation League the Defamation League um, because most of what they seem to do is not fighting for civil rights, it seems to be in defaming people. And we see a lot of defamation going on. Um, I've, I was just defamed. Uh, by Alan Dershowitz. Um, Alan Dershowitz, the pro-Israel super lawyer, has demanded, uh, he's declared that I am outside the, the range of acceptable rhetoric, um, which is really a badge of honor coming from a guy who's called for um, raising and destroying entire Palestinian villages, um, and who has urged federal law enforcement officials to place needles 
under the fingernails of terror suspects and torture them until they confess to crimes they may or may not have committed. So, you know, I'm, I'm, it's really nice to have him attack me. He's actually called for my own father to condemn me. Um, and he's called for Bill and Hillary Clinton to condemn me as well, uh, which is sort of a bizarre attack. It goes back to the fact that my parents worked in the Clinton administration in the 90s. So you see if you start telling the truth, and no one has been able to debunk the facts in my book, Goliath, which is for sale here. Um, if you start telling the truth about un, you know, uncomfortable things, uh, they'll, go, they'll even go after your family, they'll go after your community. In my case, uh, the father is being blamed for the sins of the son, which is incredibly unusual. Um, I've also, my book has been named by a liberal columnist who's a colleague of mine at the nation as a, um, the Hamas Book Club's uh, Book of the Month. So I just want to welcome you all to the Hamas Book Club. Uh, you know, should all be proud to be here. Um, you know, I've, I've been on the road for uh, about a month, from city to city. It's been a really exhausting book tour. Um, I want to be as aggressive as possible, getting the message out to as many different audiences as possible. And I'm received incredibly warmly. Actually, the reception is, is better in inverse proportion to my distance from New York City for some reason. Um, and so I've, it's, it's, it's been great being out here so far, but it's also really hard to, to sleep and keep things in perspective. And I know uh, Imran has been doing a lot of hard work to pull this together, and he hasn't been sleeping a lot. And you know, I realize, I realize, you know, the reason we're not sleeping isn't just because, uh, isn't just because, you know, I'm in a strange hotel room every night, and, you know, it might be noisy, or because I'm flying on early flights every day. It's because um, our consciences are troubled by what's going on around us. And this is how we, we maintain our perspective on why we're doing this work and why we're you know, spending so many sleepless nights, why we're making these sacrifices, why we're withstanding these smears, and why we have to push back against them, and why many of you have even overcome a barrier of fear to come here tonight, because this conference has been attacked by an Islamophobic group called the Florida Family Association, which attempted to shut it down, and the, 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 this went to the highest levels of Hilton, and the people from corporate at Hilton immediately rejected these attacks as big as pure bigotry and without any discussion. So they definitely deserve a lot of applause. Uh, they were actually attacking gay Americans and attempting to prevent same-sex marriages. Um, and they even tried to organize a boycott of a Star Wars video game uh, because they claimed that it contained gay stormtroopers. So I ask you all to not inform this Florida Family Association that uh, Chewbacca is living alone and is unmarried. <laughs> but I want to go back to this theme of sleeplessness and you know having our consciences tro conscience troubled, you know because I have spent many sleepless nights while writing this book, thinking about the human rights violations. Of the people against the people who I met while I was writing it, and you know I'm thinking right now about a village I just I just visited in the Negev Desert, a Bedouin village that contains Israeli citizens um, who are not allowed to build there legally um, because they are not um, they're considered a, a threat to the demographics of the Jewish state. It's called Um Al Hiran, and the state of Israel has just today issued demolition orders which will require all of them to leave, all of their homes will be demolished. These are dozens of families, and they will be replaced by a Jewish-only village sponsored by the Jewish National Fund, which is raising tens of millions of dollars as a nonprofit inside the United States, and is directly engaged in ethnic cleansing. You know, I can't sleep sometimes when I think about the fact that 900 demolition orders were just issued in Jerusalem by the Jerusalem municipality, which will require 15,000 indigenous Palestinian residents of Jerusalem to become homeless. And this hasn't been reported in our media, really adds to the weight that I, that I feel in my conscience. It's hard to sleep when you realize that we're being watched and we don't even know it by the NSA. We have no way of knowing whether we're being watched or not because the NSA refuses to pre present statistics 
to Congress on how it's spying on millions of Americans. And the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, lies under oath to Congress. And congressional requests for data are rejected. It's hard to sleep when we look in our own backyard here in Arizona. And we realize that 500 migrants are dying trying to cross through the desert to get across the border to reunite with their families. Every year, 500 are dying. The numbers keep going up. And all they want to do is contribute to our society. This is a 27% rise in migrant deaths in the last year. We consider that 400,000 undocumented migrants who have families and roots in our country were deported last year. 400,000 by Barack Obama. Most of them have no criminal background whatsoever. And it's even harder to sleep when we consider that Joe Arpaio is one of the most popular politicians in Arizona. Joe Arpaio, the bigoted neo-Confederate, who makes no secret of his bigotry. In fact, he campaigns on it. We look in our own communities and we see rising poverty. We notice that 16.4 million Americans are living in poverty, while Wall Street this year doled out $91.5 billion in bonuses to its executives and to its hedge funders. And we look at both parties in Washington, and they have both collaborated on a deal to, sl um, to starve children. They've proposed hundreds of millions of dollars in food stamp cuts that will mostly affect children and poor families. And you know, so we see that the problem isn't polarization or divisiveness. Sometimes it's good to be divisive if you're dividing good and evil. But in this case, the problem is consensus. Consensus between two parties which agree on so many things that we can't deny are evil. We can't deny that, and the UN report has confirmed this, that the policies of the Obama administration in the tribal areas in Pakistan are absolutely immoral and according to the UN may amount to war crimes. And when some survivors of the drone strikes in Waziristan, some young survivors went to testify to Congress last week. One of them declared, I used to love blue skies. Now I wish for gray skies, because on the gray skies, those are the days when the drones don't come. His grandmother had been killed before his eyes while she was teaching him how to garden. And only five members of Congress showed up to listen to these young drone strike survivors give their testimonies. That's five out of 438 members of the House. So we have to recognize now that we are moving beyond the civil rights era, which Obama claims the mantle of. And we're moving into the human rights era. This is a much bigger cause, and it's a much bigger burden. And it's going to require many more sleepless nights. And it's why I really chose to come here, um, and why it's such an honor to be here with an organization like CARE that's on the front lines of this new struggle for human rights and on the front lines of democracy. And I really, it couldn't be a higher honor for me. I want to talk about some of the work that needs to be done and some of the work that, that CARE is doing, especially on the issue of Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is, it's a mood. And it's a mood that we've seen in the past. Today is the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. But in 1938, uh, racist, bigoted thugs attacked Jewish businesses and singled out people for who they were. This led directly to the final solution, which culminated over a course of several years. It wasn't clear that this was going to happen in the beginning. It all started with racist rhetoric. As Martin Luther King said, genocide is the ultimate outcome of racism. So in this country, in 2011, I read a very disturbing poll from Ohio State University. And it showed that Islamophobia was at an all-time high. This mood, this mood which I feel is the same mood as anti-Semitism, the same mood as anti-black racism, the same mood as homophobia. It showed that, that um, after 9-11, half of Americans described Muslims as trustworthy. But by 2011, only one-third did which is kind of unusual. You would think there'd be much more of a backlash after 9-11. Showed that public opposition to racial profiling, especially in Muslim communities, had completely disappeared. 
One in three Americans agreed with the following statement. Muslims are mostly responsible for creating the religious, religious tension that exists in the United States today. Um, and twice of the, uh, no, the number of those unwilling to have a Muslim friend doubled to 20 percent, um, including 24 percent of liberals claiming Muslims made the U.S. more dangerous, self-identified liberals. According to this um, poll, um, liberals and moderates essentially converge towards conservatives and their attitudes about Muslim Americans. I'm going to talk about some of the factors behind this mood. One of them is that Islamophobia is not limited to right-wingers like Pam Geller or people like Zudi Jasser, who many of you are familiar with. Uh, it's, we find it on primetime TV, on HBO, expressed by Bill Maher, who two weeks ago declared that Islam is a singular threat to civilization at a panel with no Muslims present and no challenge except from Michael Moore, who you know, put up an okay challenge, but he never seems to host any Muslim guests. This is, this is also partly failure on the part of Barack Obama, who is over, overcompensated against the attacks on him. He's been obviously accused of being a crypto-Muslim. Uh, his middle name hasn't really helped him with bigots too much. But I've noticed that since he's been elected, unlike George W. Bush, and correct me if I'm wrong, he has not visited, made a public visit to a single mosque. I think this is true. And then and we see him pandering constantly to the special relationship between the U.S. and Israel, even while he seems to very greatly dislike Benjamin Netanyahu. I want to kind of elucidate this relationship, this unusual relationship. Um, now, there was a uh, terrorist attack on some Israelis in Europe, which obviously bore condem it deserved condemnation. Obama rushed forward in August 2012 to declare this was a barbaric terrorist attack against innocent civilians that was completely outrageous. He used the word terrorism over and over and over. This is a very charged and subjective word, um, and he felt compelled to condemn this in the most public way possible. Strangely, though, in July 2012, when a right-wing uh, former member of the military, a white supremacist, attacked a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, uh, because he mistook it for a mosque, he thought that Sikhs are frequently attacked because they're mistaken for Muslims. Um, actually, recently in Harlem, just a few blocks from Malcolm X's mosque, a Sikh was brutally beaten by a group of young men who were calling him Osama. Um, and so, Obama, and so this, the, these Sikhs were massacred, and Obama didn't call this attack, which was political, which was designed to impact their community and intimidate their community and intimidate Muslims, he called it a terrible, tragic event. He did not visit the site of the event, even though it was right in the United States, two-hour flight from Washington, D.C. And he said that what we should do, instead of condemning the racism and condemning Islamophobia, is do some soul searching. I can't stand this rhetoric of soul searching. I think we know what's in our souls. We need to actually do things. We need to actually take action against racism and condemn it. So Obama is the first African-American president, and that symbolizes something very special about our country and our society. But he is also the first president in American history to pledge to fight Palestine solidarity activism in this country um, as a promise to Benjamin Netanyahu. He's also the first president to have a kill list, which resulted in the phenomenon I described in Waziristan. Uh, we see an era characterized by heightened repression, law enforcement repression, spying, and capitulation and overcompensation in the face of an organized right-wing campaign of racism and Islamophobic bigotry. And, he, and now we'll turn to this book. This book really is one of the best reports, Legislating Fear, Islamophobia and its Impact in the United States, uh, that I've seen uh, on this phenomenon of Islamophobia. And there's a chart inside of it you can open up, you can put it on your wall if you want to have nightmares. <laughs> and it shows how much revenue has been poured in to uh, this axis of Islamophobia and who the key figures are. 
um, it says that there is about 120 million of revenue poured in from 2008 to 2011 into what I call the axis of Islamophobia. This is just in, in the U.S. I mean, this is a this is a global phenomenon. But you know, when you think about it, that's actually not a lot. Of, I mean, I feel like Glenn Beck with my chart, you know, or like the opposite of Glenn Beck because it's factual. Um, but you think about that. That's actually not a lot of money. I mean, to me, it's a lot of money because I'm a journalist and an author. So, like, I live in a little apartment in Jersey City, and I'll never make money. But you know, in the nonprofit world, it's actually not a lot of money. Like, the, there are organizations in Washington which reap uh, about 200 million a year in donations. So, and, and you see the figures. Okay, it seems like there are a lot of these um, activists: the Debbie Schlissels, the Daniel Pipes, the Robert Spencers. Um, you know, who is cited over a hundred times by the um, anti-Muslim mass killer Anders Brevik in his manifesto, the Pam Gellers, there actually aren't that many of them. They have been able to have a, a disproportionate impact on this culture uh, with a very small amount of money. And so that's, that's what should disturb us. What should disturb us is how far they've been able to get. And that fact that it requires condemnations of these figures from community leaders, especially from the top, from Barack Obama, but also from law enforcement, from local officials. You know, and there are some good law enforcement officials like Lee Baca, who is the sheriff of LA County, who's come out strong against these figures. And there's some bad ones that I'm going to talk about. There are some good public officials like Bill de Blasio, who was just elected mayor of New York, right. with, with massive, massive groundswell of support from the Arab community in New York and the Muslim community because they were sick of Ray Kelly and the racial profiling. And de Blasio has said to the Muslim community, you don't have to live under surveillance all the time. I'm going to talk about this. And obviously his feet needs to be held to the fire. Need to be held to the fire. But this is, an, the attitudes that have been cultivated by this group, by this axis of Islamophobia, have worked their way into certain sectors of law enforcement. They've worked their way into um, the FBI in, in some sectors. They have worked their way into prosecutions, like the prosecution of Semi Alarian and the prosecution of the Holy Land Foundation, who are in prison for life, for donating to charities raising money for charities in the Gaza Strip, which the USAID and the Red Cross were simultaneously giving money to. They were put on trial and convicted without having ever been charged of any operational connection to any act of terrorism. And a Mossad officer from the Israeli secret, uh, secret intelligence organization was allowed to testify without giving his identity in this trial, meaning there was no possible way to cross-examine him which is completely undemocratic and completely unconstitutional. So we see these attitudes impacting real life events and creating and establishing a veil of intimidation. In New, in New York City, where I live, this has been particularly pervasive. This attitude, we've seen it in all of the bogus uh, prosecutions where some young man who may have uh, may be disturbed or mentally ill is induced into claiming that he will, he will commit a terrorist act by FBI agents, so it's an FBI manufactured plot. This happened in the case of Ahmed Farhani, which is a name you should know. He is, uh, has a severe uh, mental health problems. And the reason that the um, NYPD went after him was because they were on a fishing expedition going after Palestine solidarity activists. They were going after the organization Al Alda, and they failed to find anything because nothing was going on there. The NYPD, actually, according to a lawyer friends of mine in New York, has a Palestine file, and they have actually attempted to prosecute people in Al Alda based on statements they made in protests calling for Palestine to be freed. This has been presented as evidence in their prosecution. So it's, we see an attack on free speech by the NYPD and its targeting of Arab and Muslim communities. The NYPD, under Ray Kelly, who is the outgoing police chief, who has just been basically defeated in the election of Bill de Blasio, established an intelligence division, which was largely secret. There's a great book about this division called Enemies Within 
uh, by Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman. And that's the rhetoric we hear from Zudi Jasser, and it's the rhetoric we hear from Pamela Geller about enemies within. Jasser says that 80% of mosques are radicalized with absolutely no evidence. The idea that there are secret Muslim Brotherhood operatives working in Congress. This whole idea that Muslims are a fifth column is the core idea behind the axis of Islamophobia and the NYPD's intelligence division. Now, the, this intelligence division was headed by someone named David Cohen, who's a former director of the CIA. Um, the CIA is technically not allowed to spy on Americans, so they just moved their people into that NYPD. Here's what David Cohen said. And just listen to this rhetoric, and I'm sure it will remind you of things you've heard Zudi Jasser say. They escape detection by blending into American society. This is Muslims. They may own homes, live in communities with families, belong to religious or social organizations, and attend educational institutions. They typically display enormous patience, often waiting years until components of their plan, of their plans are perfectly aligned. So what he's talking about is that any, that the more normal you are, the more you assimilate, the more dangerous you become. The fear isn't that you will uh, appear radical and dangerous. The fear is that you will assimilate and become American. And so what Cohen did, what he did was he decided to monitor every aspect of Muslim life in New York City and put every Muslim uh, restaurant, every halal restaurant under surveillance. Um, his officers would go into, into restaurants or he'd hire um, what he called mosque breakers. Um, who are often people who had been compromised because they had committed some crime and they come from that community and they, they were basically turned into plants. And by the way, I don't know if there are any plants here tonight, but I'll tell you what I do with uh, plants is I, I pour water on, them, water on them and I tell them to grow up. <laughs> but they, uh, They began reporting on the food that was served in Egyptian restaurants, the quality of the food, and I think that these files should be used as kind of a Zagat restaurant guide in New York now. They began reporting that people were watching Al Jazeera in these restaurants. And, and David Cohen began classifying all of the areas he was mapping under racial classifications. Everyone was put into racial files. Uh, this is particularly disturbing to talk about on the anniversary of Kristallnacht for me, just to even think that this is happening in my country. He even had a file for black Muslims. Um, and what a former senior official from this intelligence division told the Associated Press is we are mapping New York City like Israel maps the West Bank. In other words, New York City was being treated as occupied territory and Israeli methods of occupation and repression had worked their way into American law enforcement and consolidated themselves in the heart of the largest law enforcement agency in the world. This, as I said, this phenomenon was, was defeated in New York, and we have to hold de Blasio's feet to the fire. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do in Phoenix because these sorts of techniques are being imported into our communities. Um, I noted in a talk I did a few days ago in LA that um, over 9,000 law enforcement officials have been trained by former Israeli intelligence and law enforcement officials through the through JINSA, the Jewish Institute for Nation, National Security Affairs, which was the home of Wolf, uh, Wolfowitz and Fight and Richard Pearl, the architects of the war on Iraq. Um, and they're being subjected to these methods where, they are ten where they're basically instructed to see the other as a potential terrorist and not as a fellow citizen. It's incredibly dangerous and it needs to be rejected and condemned uh, from law enforcement. But I, I want to talk about what's happening outside this country because we've seen a disturbing uh, phenomenon in, pla in a place we didn't expect it to take root. Islamophobic rhetoric has, is, is, is convenient if you want to dehumanize and demonize someone and create political space to act against them in ways that might not have been acceptable before, you need the popula your population and your constituency to support those acts first. And where we've seen it 
I'll, 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 I'll ask you, uh, I'll kind of quiz you. I'll, I'll read you a uh, quote from a popular television host from a major network uh, where this is taking place, where this kind of rhetoric is being exported. And this host declared the following. The issue is not whether Obama is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood or not. The issue is that is a, it is a fact that Obama has used the help of the Muslim Brotherhood in his administration. And this host went on to name people like Abu Patel and Salam Mariati <laughs> and Mohammed Ali Biari, who is in the Department of Homeland Security as secret Muslim Brotherhood operatives. This host was not an American TV host. This wasn't Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity, who always loved, who loved to have Zudi Jasser on, or Glenn Beck, who called Zudi Jasser the Muslim we were all waiting for after 9-11. He actually said that. This host was a host of ON TV in Egypt. And this took place right after the violent military coup on July 3rd. And this campaign, which had been imported to Egypt from the United States, which had been ginned up in the, in the Congress by the brilliant minds of Michelle Bachman and Louis Gomer, uh, had suddenly become convenient in Egypt because there were thousands of people who were supporters of the ousted uh, Muslim Brotherhood government and of President Morsi, the elected president of Egypt, protesting nonviolently in the neighborhood of Rabah. And the army wanted to do an operation. And so it needed to dehumanize these people. And most shockingly, we saw as this conspiracy theory worked its way into Egypt, uh, that people like Bassem Yusuf, began calling the Muslim Brotherhood neo-Nazis, borrowing this rhetoric we hear from Islamophobes about Islamofascism, linking them to Nazis. Um, we saw these, uh, these stories in Rosel Youssef, which is an Egyptian tabloid, began to be distributed in Egyptian society um, among Egyptian liberals who fashioned them as the enlightened ones. And then we saw the Rosal Youssef story translated back into English by Stephen Emerson, who is named in this report, the self-styled and discredited terror expert slash huckster, uh, to, re to, to basically legitimize American Islamophobia. We saw the symbiotic relationship building between Egyptian liberals and American Islamophobes, and it culminated with the massacre of those protesters in Rabah, and with people cheering it on, with mainstream Egyptian media figures cheering it on, and with Michelle Bachman and Louis Gomer getting on the next plane to Egypt to celebrate uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the figurehead of the Egyptian coup, this you know Pinochet on the Nile figure, mm. and, and compare him to Abraham Lincoln. That's what Louis Gomer did. So we see here the logical outcome and danger of Islamophobic rhetoric. We see why it's introduced, why it needs to be fought, and really what we're up against. I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of work to do, but there's a lot that gives me hope. Um, at my last you know, talk at CARE in the Bay Area, um, I was told before the talk that you know, with all my gloom and doom, I need to close on a note of hope. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know that's actually not that hard for me to do, um, not just when I look at this organization um, and the really sophisticated activism that I see in the Muslim community in the US, um, but I look at organizations like Students for Justice in Palestine and what they're doing on campus, the massive Jewish participation they're getting. Um, I look at the massive support I've been getting on this book tour that I didn't expect in the face of these smears and seeing the smears be pushed back um, I look at what CARE did when Abercrombie and Fitch tried to fire a young woman because she wore hijab. They successfully sued her. And why this is so important is because Abercrombie and Fitch has tried to decide through their catalogs and their commercials and their marketing what a, what a real American looks like. And CARE has said, no, that's not what a real American looks like. And to me, I look out here and I say, this is what America looks like. And I look at the young activists who know that 
their activism will show up on their resume when they apply for jobs, and they know that that's going to be an asset. Um, and they know that there will be opposition, and that people will hate them for what they do, but they do it anyway, because they have to. They have no choice. We really have no choice but to be who we are and do what we do. I think that we've witnessed a very discouraging time with the Arab Spring. We've witnessed some terrible trends in this country, but we still have to keep mind of the fact that, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of history does bend towards justice. It might be a long arc. That's it right. might be a really long arc. I might not see it bend there in my lifetime. That's right. But I want to get there. I want to get there with you. Uh, so let's keep going and remember that you and your organization are really leading the way in this new struggle in the post-civil rights era, in the human rights era. So thanks a lot. everyone in this room who did not raise their hand earlier that they were part of a, a community that's making a difference. I hope for those of you who did not raise your hand, inshallah, Max has encouraged all of us to raise our hand and more than just our hand, inshallah. Thank you very much, Mia Max. And uh, I, there's a special presentation I'd like to make. Um, um, and it's a, it's a special one because uh, um, obviously I've known uh, the brother for a long time. He's been a lot to me and uh, I'm an emotional guy. My wife would testify. <laughs> So this is actually uh, for a very special award uh, that CARE Arizona would like to uh, honor uh, Imam Anas Haleo, uh, who was one of the pillars. <laughs> He's one of the pillars of our community and responsible, responsible for most of the people that you see on the CARE Arizona team today. Um, he's been with CARE Arizona chapter for over six years, alhamdulillah. Um, he's done a lot of behind the scenes work of keeping the chapter updated, whether when it comes to updating with the IRS or the Corporation Commission. Um, he is the key responsible for his figure who's been standing up on many issues that we've had in this phase, including the SB 1070. Uh, he's an uh, interfaith community leader uh, and he's allied with multiple organizations here that are represented here today. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, he, and he's always been ever present in the media whenever he's called upon. Um, he is also the Imam of the Scottsdale Masjid. Uh, he has been, uh, as I said, the main advocate for CARE Arizona for the past few years. He's married with four beautiful children, mashallah, uh, and he's a full-time engineer at Intel. And for his tireless work, um, for everything that he does, we would like to present him with the CARE Arizona Community Service Award.
uh, last year's work, uh, since I've, I've left, officially I've left the uh, organization, but I'm uh, behind it and my support as much as they can. But I'm really proud of the work that the chapter has done in the last year. Uh, and uh, the people on the board right now uh, are people that I am really happy to see. And uh, I'm sure they're going to take the organization to the next level. Um, I look at care as something that is very strategic for our community. I know a lot of times when we donate money, we look at the masjid, we look at the school. But I think care is the uh, long-term uh, vision for our community. As a community, we have to have a vision. We cannot just keep reacting and reacting and reacting. And if you look at the Muslim Ummah in general, we have been in this reactive mode for so long. And care, in my opinion, is one of the answers to our reactivity. I don't know if this is the right word. But we have to be proactive. We have to take the initiative. We have to tackle the problem before it becomes so big and so huge. And we end up just reacting uh, in a random manner. So uh, I think CARE is the, is the one organization in our community that is looking at the long-term strategic goals of our community. And we heard a lot about uh, civil rights, Islamophobia, you're going to hear more. And just a quick example, uh, you, uh, somebody mentioned the, uh, the uh, prayer that I had to do in front of the, uh, the House uh, or the Senate earlier this year, the uh, Arizona Senate. Almost a few hours later, uh, Robert Spencer put me on his uh, Jihad Watch uh, list. And, uh, and then Pam Geller picks up the, you know, uh, that phone same day. And then I did a, a quick uh, Google search a few weeks later. And I found that about 50 websites have picked up. Uh, and uh, none of them was friendly. One, none of them was nice. And there was not a single, I think there was only one single website that had a positive, uh, you know, thing to say about the prayer. That tells us, and it's a, a small, very, very small example, but tells us the extent of Islamophobia in this country. And I'm very serious. Um, a lot of us, we don't think of it as a, a problem because it's not urgent, we think. But I'm telling you, this is one of the most challenging problems as a Muslim community. And as Americans, we have. And, uh, you know, the keynote speaker mentioned that immediately after 9-11, we did not have the same uh, problem we had in 2011. The hatred is growing. It is not subsiding. It is growing. Why? Because of the Islamophobic machine in this country. Because of these people. And now the other scary part to me, I'm, I'm learning of it as well, is the fact that this Islamophobia now is going through the liberals' uh, you know, ranks. So it's not now limited to these uh, neoconservatives or the, you know, the people on the, on the right side. Um, i just like to rem remind everybody as I close, um, I'm not supposed to give a speech here, but I, I, don't know, I just thought uh, a few things. Uh, I want to remind you of one ayah, one verse, because I'm an imam, so I have to bring that slide as well. There's one verse in the Quran that we all should think about tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, God says in the Quran, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu kunu qawwameena bil qisti shuhada'a lillah. A lot of times as Muslims we think that, yes, we are against injustice, we speak against oppression, we should not, uh, we should not be oppressing ourselves or our, our uh, families, our people around us, our neighbors, etc. But this verse is not asking you just that. This verse is telling you, you have to stand up for justice anywhere, anywhere you are. And it doesn't say you stand up once or twice. If you know Arabic, it says قوامون, which means you are standing up for justice on a regular basis. Every day, every time possible. Question to you tonight, are you helping, if you're not doing it yourself, are you helping the people who are doing that? This is an Islamic command, an Islamic injunction upon all of us that we help justice, we help establish justice wherever we are.
So I hope that tonight will be your chair. Again, thank you very much for this award. I don't think I deserve it. I think many people here deserve it more than me. But it's not here. It's a very good job. Uh, and drive down to Chandler, Arizona, sometimes two, three times a week to start our youth group that had three attendees. While he was a chairman of care, while he was a mom of the North Scottsdale Masjid, while he was working full-time and taking care of his four kids, so him and his wife and his family are really some of the most important people, I think, in our community, and he's so humbled to say that he doesn't deserve it. I think he should get this award every year, so. Um, also, uh, let's thank uh, Max again. That was a great, insightful speech, and I encourage all of you guys to continue learning. Um, I encourage you all to continue learning about the work that he does do because it is unfortunate but rare that we do not have enough leaders like Max Blumenthal, like Imran Ennis. His book is outside. I think you guys should all go out and um, check it out. You guys can check out his Twitter too. He um, tweeted the Islamophobia report that he mentioned. Um, but I definitely encourage you all to take a quick look at his book and you guys can even feel free and stop by and uh, chat with him throughout the evening today. But there are not enough leaders like Imam Anas, like Max Blumenthal, like even our board members who work so diligently, our volunteers, and you guys are all such a great support for standing with us through all this work. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce is also one of those rare but encouraging leaders in our community. Um, Imran Siddiqui is an entrepreneur, he's an MBA from ASU, um, he also recently opened up a great coffee shop you guys should all check out in Valley. Uh, so um, he, uh, one of his most exciting things that he does alongside Kara is that he is editor of the blog is Stop Islamophobia Now, which goes hand in hand, some of the biggest submissions we've had in the past year. And he's been published in a wider media outlet, you can read more about him in our little pamphlet. And I'm sure you've seen him in uh, many of CARE's press releases in the past two years. He uh, took over as the chairman of the board earlier this year after Imam Menace. Um, he's going to come and speak to us a little bit more about CARE and show you uh, and highlight some of the work that we've also done. Uh, 